Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Area. The Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, presents the 8th Annual Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Eric Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer <laughs> Session. My name is Ed Boyko. I'm the course director. Uh, the title of today's uh, course is Genetic Epidemiology, and I'm pleased to, to introduce to you today Dr. Karen Edwards. Dr. Edwards is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and the Institute for Public Health Genetics and director of the Center for Genomics and Public Health at the University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Edwards will be speaking today on the subject of linkage analysis. I'd like to take just a second to back up and clarify a, a couple of things. So let's take the big picture first about why we're even doing a linkage analysis why genetic epi even exists. And I think it's important to have this in context because we lose sight of it. So here we are looking for genes that cause disease. Why are we even bothering to do that? Is it because we're just curious and have to have something to do or what's the reason behind it? The basic idea be behind trying to identify genes that increase susceptibility for disease are a couple of reasons. One, it may help us understand the etiology of the disease. It may help us actually do a better job of diagnosing the disease, particularly if we learn that, um, for example, with diabetes, heart disease, cancers, for example, that there are actually different subtypes of the disease with different etiologies. That can be important for clinical practice. The other area that people are focusing on is, if you know the etiology of the disease, can you develop better treatments to treat those diseases? And ultimately, where a lot of the work in genetic epidemiology is going is in pharmacogenomics and things like that, which is personalized medicine. For example, it may be that we identify gene variants that actually influence how drugs are metabolized. And there are certainly a number of examples out there right now. And it may be at some point in the future that based on your genetic makeup, you may be prescribed a different treatment for your disease that's going to work better than some other treatment based on your underlying genotype. Now there's certainly a lot of hype about pharmacogenomics, but there are some examples out there right now that make us think that there may be some applications in more chronic diseases. So I think it's important to have the big picture in mind about what we're trying to do here, and that may also influence what type of studies you guys are involved in. I'll also say that um, right now people are very interested in identifying these genes identifying, for example, interactions with drugs, this pharmacogenomic area. But what's happening a fair amount is that frequently once we identify genes, people just kind of move on and they don't go back and do the good <coughs> epidemiology. For example, how predictive is that gene in particular forms of disease? What information is it giving you that may be useful in a clinical setting or may not? Is there any added value to knowing this information for clinical practice? What modifiable environmental factors interact with those genes to alter either increasing or decreasing our risk of particular diseases. Most of the genes that we're looking for and identifying are not deterministic. For the most part, these genes increase your susceptibility for disease, but don't necessarily mean that you will get the disease for sure. That's why I try to use the term susceptibility gene. Now, in some cases, the probability is very high that you will develop the disease, but in other cases it's not, okay? So in those cases where it just increases your susceptibility, so somebody may be genetically susceptible to developing a particular disease, I think it then becomes important to understand what the environmental factors are that we can modify to decrease that risk. And I think this is where good epidemiology really comes in. Once the genes have been identified, we're fairly confident that that particular gene is involved in the disease, then we need to understand the epidemiology. So then it comes back to well-designed epidemiologic studies using those genes as an exposure, like any other exposure we would use in epidemiology, and understanding 
the etiology, the epidemiology, and what we can do to um, improve practice or improve public health. So that's kind of the big picture, and we very often get caught up in this gene hunting frenzy and forget to think about the bigger picture. So I'll put that out there for you guys to make sure that you do um, in your work. Okay? Take these findings, put them into practice, design good studies, understand what these things are really giving us. Well, I have a, a big picture question. Um, I was talking to an immunologist and trying to describe genetic epidemiology, and I, I, I did, I guess, in a bumbling kind of way. And he said, but, but how is that different from human genetics? And usually I don't think that working with disciplinary boundaries is all that interesting. But I said, well, it's human genetics, but with using epidemiologic techniques. And I mean, was that a good answer, or was that? I, I think it's a pretty good answer. The, the <laughs> if I were left to define it, I don't know that I would do any better, because the, the fields and disciplines that overlap statistical genetics, genetic epidemiology, molecular epidemiology, and human genetics. There is a lot of overlap between all these disciplines, and I would say, generally speaking, genetic epidemiologists use population-based approaches to try and understand the etiology of the disease. Although when you're working in genetics, you have to think about the populations that you're working with, and it's maybe not populations to the level that epidemiologists think about. It's, you know, populations meaning, um, if you can even believe this is a, a realistic situation, more homogeneous groups of people, which we're finding that that's really not a very accurate descriptor. Okay. Yes? Maybe at this point it would be convenient to ask the question I sort of brought up before is about Alzheimer's disease because they talk about these determinant genes and these susceptibility mm -hmm. genes. And from my standpoint, I've seen this constantly, and I, the, I, I think the, the designation is misleading. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's the thing is if the, if the gene has its impact a little bit earlier, then it's a deterministic gene. If it's a slightly later, then it's a susceptibility gene. And is, I mean, is that really a fair distinction? Aren't they all just different degrees of susceptibility? Yeah, and isn't I, that something that we should really be understanding much more clearly in all this work we're doing? Yeah, I, I think, you know, in some of these things, it's an arbitrary cutoff. What is early versus what is later? And I, I think the important distinction is, especially when you're communicating to patients and populations, is this idea of genetic susceptibility versus genetic determinism. That, you know, once we start identifying more and more genes for these chronic diseases, it's going to be critical that we understand how to interpret this and relay the information to patients. Because in one sense, you don't want to give them a false sense of security. For example, BRCA1. Okay? Let's say you have a woman who comes in who's very concerned about breast cancer. You know, maybe she does or doesn't have it in her family. And she decides that she wants to have testing for BRCA1, which you can get. There are companies, private companies out there marketing these tests, and they market directly to consumers and to physicians, so you can get these things. Let's say she has the BRCA1 test, and it comes back as negative, saying that you don't have the high-risk allele. What you don't want that woman to think is that she is not at risk for breast cancer, because BRCA1 only accounts for a very small proportion of breast cancer cases. So on the one hand, it may be comforting for somebody to know that they don't have this particular high-risk variant, but on the other hand, it doesn't mean that they will never get breast cancer. So that's, you know, where the challenge, I think, for um, clinicians and others working with patients and populations is to kind of understand what this is telling us and what it means and what it doesn't mean. And we're going to be seeing increasingly numbers of genetic tests that are marketed directly to consumers and to physicians. And this is going to be a challenge that healthcare providers are going to have to deal with. And part of that, you know, as a physician or healthcare provider, may involve going back and looking at the literature, looking at these types of genetic epidemiology studies, and trying to make decisions about what this data means. Because it's probably not always the best idea to rely on the inserts from these tests to interpret these results. So I think this is going to become increasingly a challenge in the healthcare field to deal with this type of information and think about what you're going to do. There may be situations where you think about doing a genetic test for somebody and it's like, you know, is this just a susceptibility gene? What information is it giving to your patient and how are you going to use that? <laughs>
this is a little off topic, but I think it puts um, genetic epidemiology in context, especially for healthcare providers. It's, it's going to be something that you're going to have to deal with, and it's coming rather quickly. Okay. The other general comment I wanted to make is um, it would probably have been helpful if we had provided some sort of glossary with a lot of these terms because we're flying through them so quickly, like an allele versus recombination. And I realize for people who haven't had genetics or who haven't had it for a very long time, these basic concepts can really hang you up you know, in terms of trying to understand what's going on with the material. There are a lot of good websites that have outstanding glossaries. Um, NIH has a couple. Um, Cancer Institute, other institutes have some very good glossaries on the web. Very nice definitions, in some cases tutorials and other things like that. OK, so let's um, jump back into linkage analysis. And let me do one thing um, on parametric linkage analysis before we jump into the non-parametric. And I'm going to switch over to this thing. Generally, as we said, when we're doing these parametric linkage analyses, this is our LOD score on the y-axis. Plotted on the x-axis is theta, or the recombination fraction. And remember what we said is theta, what we're interested in is theta of 0.5 as our null hypothesis versus a theta of less than 0.5 as our alternative hypotheses and um, evidence for linkage. When we do a linkage analysis, traditionally what we're doing is um, we always have our null hypothesis model of no linkage, a theta of 0.5. And then we generally run a series of models with varying levels of theta from zero, which is very tight recombination, up to values of something less than 0.5 as our alternative models. When we get done with all of these um, analyses, we then traditionally plot the LOD scores, because it's not just the LOD score, but it's actually the shape of the plot that's informative as well. Let's look at this middle one first, because this is usually the situation we find ourselves in. Okay? So what we have here is a LOD score approaching 3. We're very lucky when we get a LOD score over 3. I have to tell you, in complex diseases, I work in diabetes primarily, we're getting LOD scores between about 2.5 and 3.5. And we're very excited to get those. Okay? So usually, um, you may not have a LOD score that goes over that 3 mark, but it's somewhere in there. And typically, what you see is a plot that looks like this. Okay? So what you have is that at very small values of theta, let's say theta of 0, you actually have evidence against linkage. So what that's telling you is that marker, that location, is not the one that is responsible for your disease. Okay? But as you move away from that marker, as theta increases, your signal gets better, up to a particular point where in this case, theta may, may be 0.2 or 0.3, and then your LOD score starts dropping off again. So what this tells you is whatever that marker is, it's in the region of your susceptibility gene, but it's not necessarily that close to it. Okay, so that situation, you usually want to lay down more markers, try to get closer to wherever that susceptibility gene is, and then go from there. So this is the, the situation we usually find ourselves in. Okay. This situation is where you would like to be, but generally you are not. What this um, plot tells you is that at very small values of theta, so very, very tight linkage, you have the greatest evidence for linkage. As you move away from that location, as theta gets bigger, your evidence for linkage decreases. So what this type of plot tells you is that that marker is very close to the actual susceptibility gene. Okay? You like that? Uh, we generally don't see it all that often. Maybe in this case, you might be looking at a candidate gene with a known functional variant, and that functional variant is in very tight linkage with your actual disease gene, susceptibility gene. Okay? So those are the two uh, plots that illustrate examples of positive evidence for linkage. One, when you're very close to the actual susceptibility gene. One, when you're not quite next to it, but you're in the region. Then the third um, possibility is this would be an example of an exclusion mapping. Okay? 
So exclusion mapping, what you're saying is that at a particular location, so in other words, a candidate gene, where theta is very small, very small number of value of theta, you have very strong evidence against linkage. So that says this candidate gene or this region is not linked to our um, potential susceptibility gene. As you move away from that, it weakens up to a theta of 0.5, which is no linkage. Okay. So this is the kind of exclusion mapping example. If you're trying to exclude a region or a candidate gene, and you definitively want to say that this is not it, this is what your plot would look like. Okay? And ideally, you would have very strong negative evidence against linkage. So a LOD score of negative 2 or greater, more negative. Okay? So again, with most of the things that we're talking about, um, it's important to plot out your results and look, because it's not just the LOD score, but it's the shape of the curves that also is informative. This helps you make decisions, again, about what your next step is going to be if you find evidence for linkage. Are you in this situation or are you in this situation? If you're here, probably lay down more markers, narrow the region down, try to get something that looks like this, and then go in with your molecular biology colleagues and say, you know, we think this is the candidate gene. Can you sequence in this region for us and help us identify even more specifically what the likely functional variant is, or at least um, where within this gene is this likely to be. Okay. Okay. So now let's move on to the other sort of general statistical approach that we can take um, to try to identify where these susceptibility genes lie in the genome. And in this approach, we're going to discuss nonparametric linkage analysis. So as opposed to the parametric linkage approach, non-parametric linkage analysis is referred to as model-free methods of linkage analysis. Now what is important to distinguish here is that when we talk about model-free methods, what we mean is that we don't have to specify what the genetic model is. In other words, we don't have to specify that the underlying genetic model is a dominant model, a recessive model, or a co-dominant model. What is important to know is that um, that information is still important in influencing the power of your analyses. You just don't have to specify it. Okay? So in a sense, these methods tend to be more robust than the parametric linkage analysis because you can't misspecify this parameter. You're not specifying it, so therefore you can't get it wrong. And in a lot of ways, these uh, non-parametric approaches are very appealing for this reason, as well as they tend to be more computationally simple and fast and frequently require um, fewer numbers of relatives. In many cases, we can just use pairs of relatives like sibling pairs to do these non-parametric analyses. You can also do non-parametric analyses using extended kindreds or bigger collections of relatives, but the example we're going to talk about today is the sibpair linkage analysis, which is the one you'll probably come across most often. Now, what's important to know with these non-parametric approaches, as I suggested, is that although you don't have to specify what the genetic model is, the true underlying genetic model actually influences the power of these methods. And generally speaking, if the true underlying genetic model is recessive, in other words, if the disease-causing gene, if you have to have two copies of that to cause the disease, that's going to be the situation where these non-parametric approaches are most powerful. The problem is you don't know that going in, unless you've done some work and you have some reason to believe that it's, it's recessive. But you don't have to specify the genetic model as part of the analyses, but it does influence the power. Okay. The power is directly influenced by the underlying mode of inheritance. When we have a recessive trait, even though we may not know that it's recessive, that's when the power is going to be the greatest. So in a sense, the model is not irrelevant. You just don't need to specify it. Frequently, people use these types of approaches as a first screen, okay? that they use this as a way to say, well, we've got pretty good evidence that there's something going on. Let's go out and collect more families, or let's lay down more markers. Let's do something different. And the reason why they're used as a first screen is because they're, as I said, 
relatively fast and simple to do as opposed to the um, parametric linkage analyses. These are much, much quicker. So the non-parametric linkage analysis we're going to talk about today is the SID pair linkage analysis. This can be generalized to any type of relative pairs, but we're going to talk about sibling pairs because I think it's the easiest to conceptualize. But you can use cousins, you can use aunts and nieces and nephews, you can use any type of relative pair, but the expectations in terms of how many markers are shared between the relatives is going to differ depending on what type of relative pair you're looking at. Because, for example, aunts and nieces or uncles and nephews can only share a certain number of alleles based on how far apart or how indirectly they're related. Okay? We've talked about siblings and we've talked about the fact that siblings share on average half of their genetic material. So we're, we're, we're familiar with that situation. Um, the other advantage of using sib pairs over other types of relative pairs is that, generally speaking, siblings are easier to collect that frequently if one sibling participates in your study, it's more likely that they can get one of their brothers or sisters to participate versus getting an aunt or an uncle or some other relative to participate in the study. They also tend to be more closely matched for age and also environment than more distant relative pairs. Okay. Although there are some situations where more distantly related relatives can be advantageous, but that's a whole area of the literature that we, we won't go into and under what conditions that's true. But if you're interested, there's, as I said, quite a bit of literature out there that describes under which situations more distantly related relatives are going to be advantageous to you. The other thing is that with um, all of these non-parametric approaches, we can look at either qualitative traits or quantitative traits. So with a qualitative trait, for example, we could use something like affection status. Do you have cancer? Do you not? Do you have diabetes? Do you not? Okay, that type of trait. <laughs> what we're looking for in that situation is whether or not the affected relative pairs, and we can do these analyses where we take relatives who are both affected with the disease, those would be concordant or affected relative pair analysis, versus situations where the pairs are discordant for disease status. Depending on which way you do it, you're looking for something slightly different. And let's take the situation where you have a pair of affected relatives. The basic concept between, behind this type of approach is that if two relatives, let's say two siblings, both have cancer, if you have a candidate gene, for example, that you think increases risk of cancer, you would expect those two siblings to share the same allele if that is linked and is the cause of the cancer. Does that make sense? So pretty simply, you're saying that if there's a particular allele that increases your risk of cancer, a particular gene, that you would expect two affected relatives to share that particular allele, that particular gene, more often than expected by chance. So that's what you're looking at with these affected relative pairs. If you were looking at a discordant pair, it would actually be the opposite. Okay? If something was the genetic cause of the disease, you would expect those two siblings not to share the same gene. Okay? So it kind of depends on which approach you're taking. There is a reason why people like to use an affected pair approach, and one of the reasons is, particularly with siblings, if you have diseases that um, have a penetrance of less than 100%, or diseases where you don't see the um, onset of a disease into a, until a particular age, it's possible that if your older sibling had the disease and the younger one didn't, it could just be that they're not expressing the disease yet. And so in some ways it would be misclassification. So that's one thing you have to be careful with with the discordant pair analysis is to make sure that the unaffected sibling, you're confident that they really are unaffected. Okay? Because otherwise they could be sharing the same um, genetic information at that locus, but they just haven't expressed the disease yet. So with the affected sib pairs, at least you say they both are expressing the disease. It still could be for different reasons, but at least you've eliminated one potential form of misclassification. So the affected relative pair approaches are, are quite appealing to people. However, it can be different, difficult to find two affected relative pairs or enough affected relative pairs to do your study. Okay, so that's with a qualitative trait. With a quantitative trait, it's a similar type of idea. 
And what we're looking for here is that with the quantitative trait, two siblings, what we're looking at is, again, kind of the correlation between the similarity in the trait and the number of alleles those siblings share. Okay? With the idea, again, that if they're more similar for the quantitative trait, they should also be more similar for the number of markers they share. And we'll talk about sharing alleles identical by descent. Is anybody familiar with that term? Okay. This would be a good one to look up at the, on a glossary, but I'll try to explain it very simply so that we can understand what's going on uh, with the qualitative versus quantitative trait non-parametric linkage analyses. So we have to discriminate between two different situations. Um, the, most, the easier one is what we call identity by state. That would be at a particular location, and let's talk about assuming we've got microsatellite or very polymorphic markers here, that there are, again, um, with identical by state, what we're saying is that two individuals share an allele. They share the same form of the allele. And I'll give you a picture here in a second. Versus identity by descent, which is where the same, lo the same allele is inherited from a single ancestor. So it is the exact same allele that was inherited by both siblings from the same common ancestor. So it's actually the same allele that the two siblings have. Okay, now that was about as clear as mud. I know it's very difficult to explain these things. So let's take a look at this um, situation. So here are our parents up here. And let's look, don't look at the big A's, let's look at the uh, numbers, okay? So this mother, and generally when we're drawing pedigrees, a mother is indicated by a circle, females are indicated by circles, males are indi indicated as squares, and that's the convention for drawing pedigrees. Um, so at this particular locus, the mother has allele 1 and allele 2, okay? This is her genotype. The father has allele 3 and 4, that's his genotype. This is what we would call a polymorphic marker. In this particular nuclear family, we have four different possible alleles segregating. Okay. Now, this kind of goes back to our pedigree checking. If we were to look down here in the offspring, so here's a sister and here's a brother. These are siblings. If we found an allele 5 down here, we would know that there was a problem with our pedigree because these children cannot get, there's no allele 5 in their parents, so you have to ask where that came from. Okay? So that would be an example of a Mendelian inconsistency. That child cannot be related to these two people biologically because they couldn't have gotten that 5 allele from either of these parents. So that's what we're looking for when we're talking about Mendelian inconsistencies. The children have to have what the parents had. What differs down here in the children are the various combinations of these alleles that they get from their parents. So let's just look at this daughter, the sibling. You have a variety of different genotypes that she could have. For example, she could get the one allele from her mother. She could get the three from her father. Okay. Well, we've shown the same thing. It's for, this is a slightly different example. But this daughter could equally have gotten the two allele and the three allele, or the two allele and the, one, the four allele. She could have all of these different possible combinations, but it turns out that her genotype is one three. She got the one from her mother. She got the three from her father. We can very clearly figure out what she got from where. This is why these polymorphic markers are so nice, is you can see very clearly which allele came from which parent. Let's pretend that the father had the one allele instead of the four. If this child had the one allele, sometimes it's difficult to tell where that one allele came from. Did it come from the father or the mother? Because both of them have the one allele. When your markers are less polymorphic and there are less possibilities, it is very difficult to tell where these alleles come from. That's why the polymorphic markers are so informative for linkage analyses, because we can trace very clearly through the pedigree what came from where. If in this case the mother were affected with a disease, we would say, well, given that the mother is affected, if this thing is genetically influenced and it's associated with this 
particular locus, we would expect that either the one or the two allele would continue to be associated with disease through the pedigree. And by following that through the pedigree, we could hopefully determine whether it was the one or the two allele specifically that was associated with that disease. Okay? So that's what we kind of do in linkage analysis and association analysis. Yeah. If we weren't um, dealing with disease or if the disease wasn't expressed in the father yet, how could we ever mm. tell where it came from? Well, that's a very good point. And this is why pedigrees that have more depth, more generations are actually more informative. And this is the problem with many of these complex diseases is that if a disease is not expressed, is not penetrant, or there's differences in um, the probability that you get a disease, this is what makes these analyses so difficult. And with complex diseases, this is a huge challenge. That if these things are not expressed in some families and they're variably expressed in other families, it makes this very difficult and that relationship between the genotype and phenotype breaks up. And that's why frequently you need such large numbers of samples and it's very critical the types of um, samples you assemble for these analyses because that is one of the major problems with complex diseases. It's a good, perfect question. Yeah. That's why if we're spending so much time doing this because it's, um, there are many things that affect that relationship. Okay, so let's uh, go back to determining what we mean by identity by descent versus identity, identity by state. So we've already said that this child, this is her genotype, A1, A3. She got the one from the mother, the three from the father. Now let's say her brother, he can have a number of different possible genotypes as well, and so we'll just go through the possibilities. He could have gotten the two from the mother and the four from the father. He could get the one from the mother, the four from the father. He could get the one from the mother, the three from the father. Now, when we talk about identity by descent, what we're saying is how many of these alleles are shared identical by descent? In other words, how many of these alleles are the identical allele? So let's take the first example here. If the sister is A1, A3, the brother is A2, A4, are any of these alleles identical by descent? In other words, did, no. They don't share anything identical by descent here. Okay, so these two siblings, and you may encounter this and you say, my brother, we are not related. I know we're not. <laughs> Here's an example where you are not genetically similar to each other, okay? We all say that it's like, no, I am not related to my brother. Okay. Now, how about this situation? They both have an A1. Is that the exact same A1? Yes. Okay. So these two people are sharing the exact same allele. It came from the same parent. That allele is shared identical by descent. Okay. So the other situation that is not shared, so these siblings share, if these were the genotypes, they share one allele identical by descent. So then, again, at the same locus, here's the other possible genotype, A1, A3. They're both A1, A3. Are those alleles identical? Yeah. They both got the one from the mother, and they both got the three from the father. So in this case, they actually share two alleles identical by descent. So at this particular locus, they are identically, um, they share alleles identical by descent. So they have the exact same genotype at that particular locus. So you can see that you can go through this exercise, and in this situation, it's very easy to see what alleles are shared identical by descent. As I said, sometimes we're in the situation where, particularly, if the two parents have the same genotype, let's say the father was uh, one, two, we would not be able to tell which allele came from where, and we would not be able to definitively say how many alleles are shared identical by descent. We could say, yeah, they both have the one, but we're not sure if it's the one from the mother, the one from the father, or one got the one from the mother and the other one got the one from the father. So that allele would be shared identical in state. We actually can't tell, we can't tell whether or not it's the same exact ancestral allele. So that's the difference between identity by state versus identity by descent, and it also um, gives you a, an indication of why these polymorphic markers are better for this particular type of analysis. If you have something that's biallelic, like a SNP, 
there's only going to be two forms, let's say allele 1 and allele 2. Both parents are going to be either a 1, 2, a 1, 1, or a 2, 2. And as I said, if they're same, the same, you're not going to be able to tell definitively if those alleles are shared identical by descent or identical by state. So that's where these polymorphic markers are much more informative than the SNPs. That's the reason behind this, especially for these methods where we're relying on determining exactly how many alleles are shared between relative pairs. Okay, so let's take this a step farther. So we've already figured out um, that these siblings share zero alleles identical by descent. These share one, this combination, if that's true. Uh, these situation results in two alleles shared identical by descent. Now let's go back to our example where both of these siblings are affected with the same disease. Okay? And we have a mother who is also affected with the disease. Okay? If these things are linked to each other, if the disease is linked to this particular location, this particular, let's say, um, genetic marker that we're looking at, then we would expect that if these siblings also share the disease, they would be expected to share more markers identical by descent if the two things are linked. So that's the basic concept behind linkage analysis. And what we uh, base this on is the st statistics are based on the probability that any two pairs of relatives, in this case siblings, are going to share alleles identical by descent. The probab probability that any two siblings will share zero alleles identical by descent is a quarter. The probability that any two siblings will share one allele identical by descent is one half. And the probability that they will share two is one quarter. So what we're testing for here with the affected sib pair methods is how much do the observed values deviate from the expected proportions in a simplified way. And remember I said with the um, non-parametric methods that the underlying <coughs> genetic model is important in terms of power and that if your trait is truly recessive, these non-parametric approaches, that's when you're going to have the greatest power. Does anybody want to take a guess as to why that's true? Just kind of looking at this, looking at the fact that we've got two affected siblings, the probability that they share two alleles identical by descent, if it's not linked, is a quarter. Think about a recessive disease. What has to happen? Both siblings have to have two copies of the allele. So they actually have to share two alleles identical by descent to have the disease. In that situation, the probability, this probability, the observed value is going to be much greater than one quarter. Theoretically, what you should see in a set of um, sib pairs is that if there's no other complicating factors, if you're in the ideal situation where this is the gene that causes the disease, all of your affected sib pairs are going to share two alleles identical by descent, and you should have no affected sib pairs that share zero or one. Okay. If there's complete linkage, if there are no other complicating factors, that would be the ideal situation. You could see then that the observed value for sharing two alleles identical by descent is going to be much greater than the expected proportion of one quarter. Okay. Versus if you take something that's uh, co-dominantly inherited, some of your siblings are actually going to share one allele and some are going to share two. So these deviations from the expectation are not going to be as big. So you don't have as much power in that situation. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the reason we say with these affected sib pair methods, if the trait is truly a recessive trait, you're going to have the greatest power under a recessive model. You'll still be able to pick up if it's co-dominant, but the deviations from expectation, the observed versus expected comparisons, are not going to be as large. But you should still be able to pick it up. You may need a greater sample size to get statistical significance. Okay, so that's a lot. Identical by descent, identical by, dis by state, uh, probabilities of sharing. This is um, a lot of information here, but this is kind of the basics behind <coughs> any of these non-parametric approaches. What we're doing here in these approaches is looking and comparing the number of alleles shared identical by descent and then comparing that to either the correlation with the phenotype if it's a quantitative trait or if they're affected sib pairs 
do affected SIB pairs share more alleles identical by descent than you would expect? Okay. All right. Phew. So SIB pair linkage analysis. Let's move on to a very specific um, example of this non-parametric method. And as I said, this is something that many of you will probably actually consider doing um, because, as I said, collecting SIB pairs is much more straightforward. What we're going to talk about here in particular is when we have a quantitative trait versus the affected SIB pair approach that we just discussed. So as in, with the other um, non-parametric approaches, we make no assumptions about the model, the underlying genetic model. In other words, we don't have to specify what it is. We assume that the siblings come from a random mating population. We assume that the population is in equilibrium. We'll go into this a little bit more when we talk about association studies. We also assume that the siblings are not MZ twins. They're not foster sibs. They're not half sibs, that they are full siblings. Okay. Now, this sounds easy, but in many situations when people are collecting sibling pairs, they don't necessarily collect the parents. And so you can't go through and do pedigree checking to make sure that these are actually biological siblings. Without that parental data, we can't determine whether or not the parents have passed on the same alleles to the siblings. Let's just show why that is. In the situation that um, most people find themselves in when they have sib pairs, they only collect the siblings, they have no parents. We know that within a sib, within, um, with two siblings, that there can actually be the possibility of four different alleles that are present in that sib ship. So for example, if we just look at the first potential genotypes, if this sibling is A1, A3, A3 and this one's A2, A4, we say, yeah, that's feasible. The parents could be, as we saw, heterozygous and contain the A1, A3, A2, and A4. So with any two siblings, there's the possibility of four different alleles. Without the parents, we don't know whether or not these people are actually related to each other. Does everybody see why that is? Yeah, I mean, you can see all the different possible combinations that your sib pairs could have that would be consistent with the genotype of these parents. But without that information, we cannot definitively say that these two people are actually biologically related in the way they think that we think they are. So if you're doing a sib pair analysis and you have the money or you have the opportunity, it's not a bad idea to collect the parents, at least the DNA. Even if you don't do anything with the phenotype or get any phenotypic information, if you get the DNA from the parents, it will help you to make sure that these people are actually related the way that you think they are, that you actually think they're sib pairs. As you can imagine, if these people are not related as sib pairs, these sharing expectations are going to be wrong. Okay? So your underlying expectations are going to be incorrect. If they're not related, they're never going to share two alleles identical by descent. Okay? And that would actually give you evidence against linkage if you had some pairs in there who were unrelated. Okay, so this is um, sometimes a problem, and I've actually seen people claim that they can determine whether or not these two are biologically related without parental information. It's a little hard to do that. Okay, okay so let's go back to our slides. That's just something to keep in mind when you're uh, thinking about doing a sib pair analysis and collecting siblings. Think about collecting DNA from the parents if the parents are available. They're not always. Okay, let's see. So we've already talked about actually the qualitative traits and what that looks like. I think everybody gets that. Um, as I said, you don't have to just use only sib pairs. You can use any type of relative pair, but the important thing to keep in mind is that those probability of sharing alleles identical by descent differs depending on the type of relative pair you're looking at. Okay? As I said, there are types of relative pairs where it's not possible to share two alleles identical by descent. You may be in the situation where because of how they're related to each other, they can only share zero or one. And so then the probabilities are going to be different from what I showed here. And you can find those in genetics textbooks or if you're running these analyses, obviously the program will know what the expected proportion of sharing is. But you're still looking at deviations from the expectation for whatever is appropriate for that relative pair. 
Okay, so the quantitative SIB pair linkage analysis is a regression approach. And the basic idea here is that we're taking a quantitative trait and we're looking to see is the within pair trait difference. Let's see, this is always difficult to explain in words, but I'll try it in words first and then I'll show you a picture. If the gene that we're looking at is actually the one involved in causing the disease, okay, you would expect that if two siblings are more similar for the difference in the trait, that they would be expected to share more alleles identical by descent. And it's simply a regression approach where we regress the difference in the trait between the twins by the number of alleles shared identical by descent. And in this case, we square the difference in the trait values just to make it a positive number. Okay? This is not anything magic. It can be cubed. It can be something else. But it's just so that the difference is actually a positive number. And what we're looking for here is a negative slope, so a negative correlation. If the marker or the gene that we're looking at is truly the one that causes the disease, then we expect the smaller the difference in the trait, the more allele should be shared identical by descent. And so it should be a negative regression line. And what we're testing here is whether or not that slope is negative or essentially is different from zero. So the alternative hypothesis is that the slope is negative or different from zero, as I said. We actually don't care if the slope is positive. That's evidence against linkage. If it's anything but non-zero, it's not that interesting to us. Let's see what I've got over here. Okay. Yeah, so this is a one-sided test. Um, we'll talk about this IBD versus IBS sharing when I put this picture up because it makes a little bit more sense when we look at it up here. Okay. So this is graphically what I just said, and this probably is a little bit more clear than saying it. So the basic idea here is here are our alleles shared identical by descent. We've got a pair of siblings, so we know that they can share zero, one, or two alleles identical by descent. Here's the uh, squared difference in our trait values of a quantitative trait. And in this case, you can ignore what that trait is. This could be BMI, it could be cholesterol, it could be anything. As I said, the difference is squared just so it's a positive value. And so what you see is, as this difference gets smaller, in other words, your siblings are more alike for the trait, you expect them to share more alleles identical by descent. And so you get this negative regression line. Okay. Uh, slope of zero is our null hypothesis that there's no linkage. And what you're doing is a one-sided test to say, <coughs> is this a negative slope? That's evidence in favor of linkage. Okay. P-value of 0.05 is considered statistically significant. But there are a couple of um, things that we need to point out when we're talking about these types of regression approaches. So what we're looking at generally here is here are the number of alleles shared identical by descent. And in this case, the program SAGE, which you've heard about before, um, gives it to us in the proportion shared identical by descent. So the proportion here, zero, means they share zero alleles. Uh, 0.5 means they share one. And two, or one, sorry, means that they share two. So 100% shared identical by descent are two alleles. Over here, we have our squared tra trait difference. Again, um, smaller to larger values. So the, the numbers there actually aren't important. But what's important to be able to see is the regression line. So here's uh, sharing zero alleles identical by descent. Here is sharing two alleles identical by descent. You can sort of imagine, again, you're getting used to being creative, is that there is a negative regression line that runs through here. The regression line, uh, the p-value is actually 0.03, so it is significant. Okay. You can see that it's not overwhelmingly significant, that there's some noise in here. And a couple of things to keep in mind um, with these regression approaches is that because we're drawing regression lines, outliers, especially on either end, can have a dramatic impact on the regression line. So for example, it might be that down here where you've got um, the alleles shared identical by descent proportion of zero, if you had an outlier way up here, or alternatively, if they shared two alleles identical by descent, and you had an outlier way down here, but the majority of your subjects were up here, you could see how that could have an impact on your regression line. 
So these quantitative SIB pair linkage analysis, just like other regression approaches, are very sensitive to outliers. So when you're doing this type of approach, you need to check your data, looking particularly at any outliers, because as I said, those can really pull your regression line one way or the other, and either make it look like there's false evidence for linkage, or it could go the other way. Okay. As with most of these linkage analyses, um, making decisions about what to do with outliers, you have to think carefully about. You don't want to just throw out the outlier because it's messing up your line, but if it's incorrect data or unrealistic values, you might want to think about removing that. Or at the very least, doing a sensitivity analysis where you remove that individual or a couple of individuals, rerun the analysis, and see what impact it has, and then report your results both ways because it's it's always tricky to know what those outliers are. Are they the, a true effect and, in some cases, the most interesting ones, or is it some other issue that you don't know what's going on? The other thing, this is actual in output um, from a SIB pair linkage analysis. And in the theoretical example I just gave you, the cartoon, you saw that we only had um, points at alleles shared 0, 1, and 2. But here you actually see that we've got people in between these. How can that be? We said that you can only share one allele, zero alleles, or two alleles. How can you share 1.5 alleles identical by descent or 1.75 alleles identical by descent? Okay. This gets back to the problem of in some situations where we don't have highly polymorphic markers, you can't always tell exactly how many alleles are shared identical by descent. And what you have to do is use identity by state and the allele frequency to come up with a probability that that allele is actually shared identical by descent. And so that's what you see here, is that in some situations, we can't definitively tell whether those alleles are shared identical by descent. So you use the fact that they're identical in state and the allele frequency, which determines how likely it is that they're really sharing those alleles, to come up with a probability of sharing identical by descent. And so that's when you, act, when you look at output from real data analysis, you're going to have plots all across here, and those represent probabilities of sharing identical by descent. Okay? I know the first time people look at this output, they think, what have I done wrong? What are all these values in here? They can't possibly be sharing one and a half alleles. So that's what this is. So this is actually a, a pretty simple approach. You can see why this is appealing. Um, it's a regression approach. Many of us are comfortable and used to working in regression. You can, in some packages, include covariates and do adjustments as part of your regression model. Most of us are pretty comfortable interpreting regression analyses. And this, as I said, is actually uh, a pretty common approach that people use. Siblings, very easy to collect, very straightforward. Analyses are pretty straightforward. You can scan. For example, a number of candidate genes rather quickly using this type of approach and have some nice, if you will, preliminary results that help guide your um, future studies. Yes? I just have two questions. So the x-axis is at uh, a y value of zero there. Is that right? So the differences are zero. Yeah. Right. OK. And uh, x, did you say the x or y? The, the x-axis. The x-axis, yeah. That's so, at zero. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, uh, so, so um, so do we interpret uh, this uh, result as uh, that the, uh, the allele that you've identified uh, that's identical by descent uh, is responsible for the quantitative trait or that another allele close to it? Because it's a different, mm -hmm. um, it, it seems different from what you uh, uh, described uh, previously with uh, linkage uh, having microsatellite markers and just indicating a region where the, the gene might be. Yeah, very good question. So, and I'll... I'll answer it in a couple of parts. So the first thing is, this is still linkage analysis. And so we actually are not that concerned with which allele is associated with the disease. We're still using the alleles just to look at the co-segregation and be able to estimate alleles shared identical by descent. And so, for example, in the situation that we showed, um, the one SIB pair had you know, ones and threes and twos and fours. It could be that you take another sibling pair their alleles are actually 3, 5, 7, and 8. And so you actually don't care what the particular, whether it's a 3 or a 7, 
you're just using those to estimate how many are shared identical by descent. And the actual allele doesn't matter. When you move into association studies, what you might then say is, OK, we found evidence for linkage with this candidate gene. Now, is there one of those particular alleles? Is it the three allele? Is it the seven allele that's actually associated with the disease? And so that takes us then to association studies where you actually care what allele is associated with the disease. Here we just use the alleles really to mark the chromosomal location and be able to estimate um, identity by descent sharing. Now your second part of the question, which is, does this necessarily mean that because we found linkage either to this candidate gene or this region, is that the actual one or is it something close by in linkage disequilibrium with it? That is the million dollar question in many cases, is that um, for most of these association studies, which we're going to talk about tomorrow, what you see is that the interpretation of the association studies is not always straightforward. We don't necessarily, we can't necessarily discriminate between is this allele the one that's causing the disease, or is it something close by? Is it something in linkage disequilibrium with it? And that's one of the issues that many people have with these association studies is the interpretation is not always straightforward, especially when you're using anonymous markers, things like SNPs or markers that we know don't necessarily have any known function. They're just purely random genetic markers to mark a location. If you have a marker that has a functional polymorphism, and that's the allele that you're looking at, well then maybe you might be a little bit more comfortable saying, we think this allele is actually the one that is the disease-causing allele because it's functional, it's been shown to have some um, effect on a phenotype that we're interested in, but you still don't always know. It could still be something that is close by and is associated with that particular allele in linkage disequilibrium. And we're going to talk about linkage disequilibrium either tomorrow or Friday. It's, it's coming up. Okay, but that's a really good question. OK, well, that concludes our session today on um, non-parametric linkage analyses. Thank you.